This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from constructionleadingedge.com and buildermasterclass.com. My name is Todd DeWalt. I'm your host, and it's my job to help you maximize profit and eliminate chaos. And in this case, it's going to help you sell more work at higher margins. In this episode, we're going to pull back the curtain on what's going on behind the scenes with designers and architects and customers when they're selecting a contractor for their project. If you've ever wondered, why did they pick them over me? Or is it all about price or is there more to it? Or as a lot of people wonder, how do architects and designers think? What are they thinking when they're selecting a contractor? Then this is for you. I interviewed Gene Brownhill recently, who has worked with thousands of customers and advised them on selecting the right contractor for their project. And here's what you'll find out when Jean pulls back the curtain. Some red flags that your customers are watching out for when they're considering you. We also talk about what's the ideal contract delivery method, lump sum, cost plus, GMP, time and materials. Her her answer actually surprised me a little bit. We also talk about some common trends in customer feedback that you need to be aware of, key expectations that you want to set with your clients upfront, and then how to reestablish productive communication when things get a little sideways with a client. This is a great interview. I really enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it, and I think you will as well. I do have a couple of resources I want to put in front of you to make sure you're aware of before we get into the interview. What's holding you back from experiencing hyper growth in your construction business? Likely, it's poor cash flow. Happens all the time. Moving money from one project to fund materials for your next. That's all changing. Build will pay your supplier in cash up front and then extend you 120 day terms. Finally, a pay when paid solution for contractors so you can experience the confidence to bid on projects you never thought you could. The folks at Build hear it all the time. I wish I had heard about Build sooner. So what are you waiting for? Head over to build.com slash CLE and have your materials funded as quickly as same day. That's B-I-L-L-D dot com slash C-L-E. I don't want my competition to know about Co-Construct because it gives me an edge over them. That's what one custom home builder told me after using Co-Construct for a couple of years. I referred one of my coaching clients who's a custom home builder to Co-Construct, and after using it for a couple of weeks, he said, the ability to schedule projects weeks in advance has been an absolute game changer. And there's all sorts of other things that Co-Construct does for you. It basically lets you run your entire business on one piece of software. Using Co-Construct means you'll be able to manage your projects with more profits, less chaos, and maybe even with less people. And there are two unexpected benefits to being a Co-Construct user. Number one, it gives you access and membership into a community of other builders where you can share best practices, bounce ideas off each other. And then number two, Co-Construct is not just a software company. They don't want to just sell you software. They will help you become a better builder and better at business. As one builder told me, quote, Co-Construct cares about my bottom line, not just theirs, end quote. So if you're a home builder, remodeler, general contractor, and you want to up your game, reduce chaos, increase profits, then go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash co-construct. See what co-construct can do for you. If you sign up, make sure and tell them that I sent you, and then I'm going to load you up with some bonuses, some templates that will help you get up the learning curve even faster. But go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash co-construct and see what it can do for you. Okay, here we go. Let's jump into my interview with Gene Brownhill. All right, Gene, thanks so much for being on the podcast. How are things going today? Oh, they're going great. Thank you so much for having me. And where are you located right now? I am in Manhattan right now, although it's um, a slightly different Manhattan right this second. Yeah, so we're recording this in mid-August 2020, and slightly different is a good way to describe this year. Um, Yeah. (laughs) But there's been plenty of talk about COVID and all of that stuff. But we're going to talk about something else today. We're going to talk about um, how to, how to, and the importance of matching contractors, right projects, some of the feedback that you receive from your unique vantage point of working with lots of contractors and lots of of customers on projects. But uh, then we're going to get into what you're, you're up to at Sweden. 
and how you got started. I want to make sure and, and talk about that a little bit. But one of the first things we chatted about before I hit record was you mentioned that it's incredibly important to match the right firm to the right project. Um, why is that? Because I think some people would say, if I get the bid, then it's the right project, right? So <laughs> why, why is it important to match the right project to the right contractor? And then how do you actually do that? So the way our business works is that we find, recruit, onboard the best general contractors working in all different geos, working at all different price points, but they're the best, meaning that they really appreciate both the craft um, of construction, but also just customer service and really are willing to partner with us. So once we find the best, the very last thing that we would want to do is waste a general contractor first time. We think that that is a precious commodity and there is no way that all of that pre-construction work before they have a signed contract where they're not getting paid, we want to minimize that as much as possible because the way our business model works, you know, we don't make any money until a general contractor signs a project with a sweetened client. And so we are highly motivated to make sure that we're making the right match because all that time, I mean, I see guys running around chasing all these leads. I mean, bidding 35 to one, you know, 35 projects to win one. That is such a waste of time, money, resources, energy, effort, just everything. And so if we can make it so that you're bidding on three contract on three projects and winning one, that's a great ratio. I mean, obviously we want it to be a hundred percent, but we haven't we haven't quite got there yet. So how do you determine if you have a good project contractor fit? What are some of the the factors that you look at? Well, and you know, you talk a lot about this in your other podcast about expectation setting and really understanding exactly what the other side is thinking. And so we take a bunch of time when we onboard a general contractor to understand their business. We understand the types of projects they do, the location, how their firm is organized. You know, there's all different structures of general contractors, all different flavors. We need to really specifically know, do you have an architect that works with you, like is working in your office, or do you just have access to an architect that you work with sometimes? Do you have true design build services? Are you specking materials? Are you not specking materials? Can you do permit drawings? Can you not do permit drawings? Like we need to know really the nitty gritty. It's almost like getting fitted for a suit, <laughs> the onboarding process. We know every single measurement. And then we do the same thing on the homeowner side right? Every single project that gets posted on suite, we want to understand is what is that scope? What is the budget? Where does that person live? We want to understand what are exactly the services that they're looking. And most important, do they pass our pre-qualification screen? Is their scope and budget aligned, right? So then once we have an understanding of the general vector, an understanding of the project, then we can start the, the fun of matchmaking. <laughs> but yeah, just like getting extremely clear. On both sides. Yeah, got it. Um, what are some, I think every contractor has a short list, maybe a long list of red flags when it comes to contract or, or when it comes to customers. For example, a good friend of mine will never do any work for retired engineers or retired construction attorneys. <laughs> So no. I laugh only because I, I know some of our general contractors have certain similar like profession um, exclusions. <laughs> Which, you know, that, that bugs me a little bit because I'm an engineer by training. I like to think I'm a relatively reasonable guy, maybe a little more detail oriented than, than others, <laughs> but uh, certainly working with retired construction attorneys, anybody that has their face on a billboard, it's probably not a good client, <laughs> but I'm curious. Well, I, I went to Cooper Union and I have a degree in architecture and Cooper Union only offers art, architecture and engineering degrees. Hmm. So some of my very best friends are engineers. So I certainly want to just put that out there that I would not have a clause for not working with engineers. They just, they'll probably just want like over-designed HVAC systems. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because that's just the way, the way engineers operate, very risk averse. Yeah. But what are some what are some red flags that that you either look for or you've um, determined to be red flags when you're looking at clients? So we have we certainly don't 
we don't have any profession. We don't have any geo or anything like that. Sure. You know, what we look for is a client that is open to realizing that they might not understand the pricing, right? So if we, um, if a project fails our pre-qual algo, our pre-qualification algorithm, um, we reach out to that homeowner and ask them how flexible they are on that price. How did they come to that price? Would they be willing to reduce their scope to make it work within that price? And if people aren't willing to take our advice, having done thousands of, of projects at this point, we have a, a really robust database of real construction pricing. So this is all based on the estimates that our general contractors signed. <laughs> this is like really what it costs. And if people aren't willing to listen to us, we really, we just can't, we can't forward that project onto our generators for all the reasons that I just said. We can't, we can't run the risk of having a general contractor that could be out winning projects with somebody who they're just going to be spending all of their time trying to get them to like either understand the, pro the project costs or to try to get them, you know, like value engineer their project down. It's just, we can't, but if they say, oh, you know, like, yes, if that, that estimate was based on, you know, online research that I did, it was based on my neighbor's price. It was based on, but I am flexible. And that's a customer that we can, that's a client that we can. What about um, on the other side of the table, what are some red flags for contractors that give you the indication that this is not somebody that we'd like to work with? Yeah. So, you know, I know so many sites say that they like screen or vet their general contractors. <laughs> we really do because we really are in partnership with our general contractors. And so we have got both, um, you know, an, an application process and then an interview process. And in that interview process, we're really looking for a certain commitment to customer service. And we look at it for all different ways. We, we, you know, before you even get to that interview, we ask for references and we actually do check past references. But in that interview, what we're looking for is one scenarios. So we run scenario tests, like, you know, what is an example of like an, um, a job that went really well? What is a job that went really poorly? How do you think that you were responsible for that? Like we're looking for folks who are um, collaborative, open and committed to, to, and red flags. Red flags are easy <laughs> for the most part to spot. Um, a lot of, a lot of folks who used to be subcontractors in commercial work decide that they want to move over to residential construction. And because they've spent decades on just on job sites and they've not been client facing at all, that can be a really tough transition. We, it's not that we can't help you make it, but you've got to be really self-aware and realize that your communication style has not been home for client facing work. Yeah, I've worked on the commercial side and on the residential side, and I can tell you, I have never sat across the table from a commercial client on a Sunday afternoon and had them cry about dust on their windows. That has happened with residential clients. <laughs> very different, very different dynamic. And that, that's a really good point. The communication style and the bedside manner doesn't have to be there necessarily when you're a subcontractor or even a general contractor on the commercial side. But if you're going to build somebody's dream house or their dream kitchen or their dream patio or their dream anything, you have to have a bedside manner. So that's, that's great. Um, we, we had um, every year we do these awards called the Sweeties and Sweeten is the name of the company, like home sweet home. And we, we gave an award to one of our general contractors one year because in, in the award was for most pregnant women clients at one time. He had five pregnant women all at the same time, all sweetened clients. And so, yeah, you better have um, some, as you called it, bedside manner <laughs> when folks, you know, people are renovating because of life events right? Whether they're, they've just got married, they just moved, they're having a baby, they're downsizing. People are renovating for, for reasons that, you know, are larger than just in for the most part, mm -hmm. especially our clients who are all looking for custom home renovations. So they're not looking for like, oh, just, 
you know, build me this like cookie cutter thing. They really have invested. They really do want to make this, as you said, their dream kitchen, their dream bathroom. And it's usually motivated by a life event. And so you've got to, you know, as a general contractor and it's something we definitely pride ourselves on our general contractors, you know, the empathy to understand that is important. Yeah, I think to understand that you are selling an emotion and that people are buying for very emotional reasons is important. As contractors, we tend to think it's all about scope, schedule, budget, safety, deliverables, et cetera. But the reality is there's a huge emotional component to the project. And in a lot of cases, what you're selling is a feeling. They're investing this money to build something so that they can have a feeling. And if your customers ever lose the feeling of confidence in you, then things go downhill pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 And, and they, they go downhill in a way that really reflects the fact that it is such a, an emotional an emotional experience, for lack of a better word, like renovating is just stressful. We have certainly taken out as many parts of friction as we can from the system, but it is a lot of money. It's very messy. It's a lot of, you know, from a general contract perspective, like I think being a general contractor is an incredibly hard job because of everything that we're saying, because everything that you're saying is true. It is scope, budget, but scope, budget, timeline, communication. It is all these technical aspects. And it also is salesmanship, communication, the emotional empathy to be able to connect with clients, not just at the sale process, but all the way through the project. Because when it goes wrong, you know, and again, so we, I'm not sure if we made this clear yet, but at Sweeten, so one of the, the value props to our homeowners is that we actually stay with our projects all the way to, now the funny thing is, is, you know, over almost a decade of doing this, Our general contractors find that as valuable as our homeowners, because what will happen is that because people are spending so much money, it is emotionally in charge. When it goes sideways, it can go sideways, like all caps, everybody in all caps email, (laughs) going back and forth about, as you said, like dust on a window. And our account managers and our support team are able to just jump in level set, get everybody back to what we call the path to completion. We are all on the same team. We all want the same thing. We all want this project to be completed and everybody to be happy and walk away happy. And so that that capacity to have a neutral third party support the project while we put it out there for our homeowners, it actually has been equally valuable to our general contractors because sometimes, sometimes our homeowners, you know, are just we have to be like, no, that's totally normal. He's a good guy. We work with him all the time. Or she's, it's a great firm. They're not trying to rip you off. It really does take three weeks to get a permit in your town. We've done hundreds of projects in your town. They've all taken this long. Sometimes it's good to have a hostage negotiator too. <laughs> Maybe we should rename that role. <laughs> so let's let's pause here and let's talk about Sweden. What, what exactly does your company do? What problems do you solve? And just let's talk about the company. And then I'd like to, to hear the story of how you got started. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the problem that we're solving was a problem that I had. So I'm an architect by training. I worked many years as an architect in both residential and construction. I saved up all my pennies. I bought a house and I was super excited to renovate it. And I hired the wrong general contractor. I had a terrible experience. <laughs> And I just could not believe that me who had a Rolodex of general contract and had a background in architecture still made that same. And so the problem that we're solving is really finding the best general contractors, small to medium size. So we don't typically work with really large general contractors. The people that we work with, you know, may or may not have huge marketing budgets, may or may not have a back office, you know, small to medium sized firms that do a great job that just have a really hard time connecting with great homeowners, with great projects that have real budgets. They just happen not to be multi-million dollar budgets, but $100,000 budgets, $15,000 budgets, that's still a lot of money. And so being able to attract both of those customers then match them together effectively, that is, that is the core of our business. And we're super committed to our ability to do that to the point where 
you know, we only make money when a project is signed on our platform. So we do a ton of sales and marketing and pre-work with our general contractors. We show their profiles to hundreds, thousands, and sometimes of firms, excuse me, of homeowners before we start to actually even send them even one lead for them to spend time on talking to a customer. And, and yeah, so that is, that is the, the core of what we do. We've been called renovation matchmakers. We've been called, um, you know, renovation godsends. We have a lot of like matchmaker godsends, angels <laughs> in our reviews. And obviously you work on remodeling projects, but what are there other types of projects that you, you'll you help be that matchmaker for? Like, are you a custom home matchmaker? Or do you do commercial matchmaking? So we we pretty much exclusively stick to residential renovation. We don't really get too much into commercial, although I say that in about 10% of our projects are commercial, but they're commercial because we help the homeowner renovate their townhouse and they also own three coffee shops and they wanted us to do those too. Mm. They're, you know, we did their bathroom and then they wanted us to do their dog spa. Like that's how we got into the commercial side of it. The nice thing is, is again, the projects that we typically do on the commercial side are still with the same general contractor set. So small to medium size, they can, they can do both when needed because a lot of those, they're like retail work and stuff that really require like Got it. And we'll do, oh, sorry. I just, you know, depending upon the geography. So uh, in, in different geographies. So in Philadelphia, as an example, we've done a full row house where they blew out the whole back and added a huge new extension. We have done a, a ground up building here in New York City, but they're all, again, they're like smaller residential. So I don't know what, you know, Projects, our, our largest project was $5 million, our smallest, they tend to be around our sweet spot is, you know, our average order value uh, last year was $97,000, if that gives you an idea. Okay. Like what type of projects do. So in Manhattan, that's like a kitchen. <laughs> in, in other parts of the country, or in LA, you can get a lot for $100,000, Chicago, Miami, Atlanta. Got it. Um, I want to go back to something you mentioned when you are screening or qualifying homeowners, you talk about budget. And this is, this is a big question that contractors struggle with. Should I ask them what their budget is? They don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to get anchored to some unrealistic expectation. What's, what's your philosophy on asking a homeowner about their budget? So our system only works if we ask the homeowner their budget and if that budget is within a reasonable range of what we've set our system just doesn't work without it it's very hard for me and i i understand why general contractors don't don't ask it up front and i i, I certainly i appreciate that that moment is tough because a homeowner often thinks this very same thing that the general contractor is thinking, well, I don't want to share my budget. We're going to anchor to that. Then whatever number I say, he's going to say, well, that's exactly, that's, exactly what it's going to cost. It's a little low. It's going to come yeah. It's a little low. <laughs> and so again, having Seton as a neutral third party that people can feel comfortable sharing their budget. And we, we will actually jump on the phone, as I said, and talk to homeowners where we see misalignment to try to understand where that price is coming from so that we can help set a realistic price. Like there just, there are certain costs per square foot, certain realities that construction, like it's, I often don't understand. Maybe it's because of the lack of transparency in the market. Maybe, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, construction people don't necessarily understand the tiers and the levels of construction and how that relates to price. I mean, I think that they do like, oh, multi-million dollar, like that's a different level. But below that, there's a whole different, like we use a grading system that is a whole host of information that the cost per square foot that you typically build at, the structure of your firm, like we're looking at a bunch of different things to understand like the level of documentation that you're going to be able to provide for this project, the, the level of construction and detailing that you're able to provide. But for some reason, people are like, oh no, I'm buying a, like a, a car. <laughs> like it's like, well, you can buy a Honda or you can buy like a Mercedes. <laughs> like 
yeah, kitchen, a kitchen's a kitchen, right? Mm, but no? it's just, it's just, I mean, you know this as well as anybody. It's just so untrue because yeah. you can't, you can't use even, anyway, I am so preaching to the choir. All of your audience already knows this. I just want everybody to know how much we empathize with our general contractors and how much we, we really try to understand their businesses so that we can help them to grow their businesses. Because I don't think necessarily that they want to be in the business of like educating consumers on the cost of construction. What they want to be doing is like renovating, building, signing the next project. <laughs> Those are all profitable things to do. Definitely. Speaking of signing projects, there are a variety of, well, really just a handful of typical contract delivery methods. So there's open book, there's lump sum, maybe there's some other hybrid model there. For renovation, what do you have a preferred contract method for renovation? If so, what is it? Um, documented. Documented. <laughs> just write it down. Just make sure that everybody knows. Yeah. Yes. I really, we, you know, we talked a little bit about this before we started recording. I wish that there was a standard. There just isn't within the industry. And so what we really, really require in our general contractors is that it is documented and that a homeowner understands it and understands what they're signing up for, that the expectations um, have been clearly laid out both on the contract side, on the communication side, on the payment schedule side, all of that. But no, we don't, we don't as a company have a preferred methodology. Um, let's talk about expectations. What I've found is that I'll give an example. I remember having a, a live event and had a custom home builder from Minnesota in the room. And I was talking about root cause analysis and you could chase, you could trace the symptoms, unsatisfied customers, cost overruns, et cetera, back to a root cause. And I saw this, saw him have this light bulb moment. And he realized, he said, if I would just not say certain things, early on in the project, or if I would just say certain things, if I would just anchor my customers to certain expectations or just not anchor myself to certain expectations, most of my problems would just magically go away. And that was a, an epiphany that he had. I'm curious, what are a couple of key expectations that you anchor, either you anchor renovation homeowners to, or you recommend your contractors? So we actually have um, a renovator and general contractor partnership agreement. And in it, it is an agreement in the sense of spirit of the project. It's not a legally binding tract. Um, but for each project, uh, the general contractor and the homeowner get a copy of this. And in it, it really is just about expectation setting around specific key things. So communication, what is the frequency? What is the methodology? You know, and again, we don't particularly have a preference if people are using our in-app messaging, you know, that is obviously best for us, but whatever it is, it just needs to be clear what they're using to communicate. Same thing around payments, same thing around, as you have pointed out, the end of the project. What does the end of the project look like equally as important as the beginning of the project? And just getting that, hopefully those expectations clear and document. That is like our, <laughs> like you'll hear me just say it over and over, like just as long as it's documented. Because then, as you said, so many, there's so many moving pieces in construction. And for a general contractor, they will have expectations about how a project will run based on the system that they have set up for their business. A homeowner is one, not familiar with construction, and two, not familiar with your process. <laughs> like, very important to get them, like, to get that understanding and get, like you said, to anchor people this is how I do change orders. This is how I do punch. This is how I invoice. This is how I'm going to communicate during the project. You said that you wanted to supply materials. Here's what you're going to be responsible for. And the timelines, like, like even something as simple as we have general contractors. And I know, um, again, there's so many flavors of general contractor. So I'll just, you know, this is like a controversial topic because some people hate it. And some people are like, no, it's the best. Owner supplied materials. Some general contractors just like, fuck, no, excuse my language. <laughs> like they just won't touch it. And then others are like, oh, that's the best. But let's say that you've agreed to do that. Now let's say the homeowner starts ordering these materials. Where are those materials gonna sit? 
have you guys agreed to? Are, are they getting shipped to your office? Are they getting shipped to your warehouse? Are they getting shipped to their home? Are they going to have a tub sitting in the living room for three weeks? Did you guys talk about that? You just said that the owner was going to order them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As I heard um, Brian from the Northwest, he was in a live event and he said this, they are not professional customers. Your customers are not professional customers. They don't do this every day. And they're looking for us to lead them through this process. And I, I've seen a lot of, I've seen this on $30 million commercial projects all the way down to small residential projects. The contractor just doesn't take the lead. You know, in, in a dance, somebody has to take the lead. And in my opinion, the contractor, it's your job, take the lead. If your client is taking the lead, it's probably because they don't understand the process or maybe they don't have confidence in you. And you as the contractor need to step up and say, this is how we're going to do it. If you have a problem with owner furnished materials, or if you have a problem with buying your own materials, then tell them that and say, this is how we do it. This is our process. Be explicit and specific about your process. Don't just, well, you know, he said something about buying it, or he said something about using his own plumber and I hate that. And well, you know what, take ownership and step up and lead. So yeah. that's. And, and, and taking lead is, is actually being really clear, as you said, on your process and then just moving on. It's okay. Not every flavor of client is going to be right for you. It is completely in like, I think let's go a little bit into the way that our matchmaking process from a technical person, not, not the actual matching algorithm, but just from a technical perspective, how it works. Because I think that general contractors often have why they're not stepping up to lead, as you're saying, is that there's like this false sense of scarcity out there and they feel like they need to contort to be something that they're not in order to get the job Yes. And with some hopes of being able to, I guess, like change order it or do something at the end. Maybe they can make money or, you know, figure out a process that will like fit this client. And so our, our matchmaking works very similar to a dating site, right? Both people need to swipe right in order for us to exchange actual contact information. So the homeowner needs to be interested in your firm based on the profile, the reviews that they've seen, and you need to be interested in the project. And it took us a really long time. It takes us like with a new general contractor, it'll oftentimes take like a little while for them to understand like, no, you saying no is equally important for us. Like we need that information. We need to understand why you're saying no, like please don't say yes to everything. And I think a lot of what you're talking about is just like saying yes to everything for some reason that it's just going to make everybody unhappy in the end. Yeah. If, if contractors, like if I had this thought, I, I needed to fill some propane tanks for my, my grill recently. And I thought, you know, if contractors were like, if they ran restaurants, it would be like a, a Starbucks that sold, had propane tank refills and gas pumps and fried chicken and have it your way, whatever you want, we're going to do it. And we're going to try to just do whatever you want because saying no is bad. And um, I, what I found is that saying no is actually kind and being specific. You're being kind to people by saying, this is how we do it. And we don't do that. And we're not doing you any favors by trying to avoid saying no. Yeah, that's right. And, and the general contractors who've been long-term partners with Sweeten, they've actually they say no now to, to jobs that they get outside of Sweden and refer them into Sweden because they would much rather just wait for the right jobs, the ones that they know that they can you know, do really well, make the customer happy, be profitable. Like it is worth, and I, and I know that, that that might be hard to hear for some folks, especially in this moment where like, you know, I know there's a lot of backlog of work, so people are super busy now, but there's not clear visibility into the future. And so people might, you know, firms might start thinking like, oh, well, now's the time to, you know, if I've only been doing, you know, $200,000 up full renovations, like maybe I should slide back into doing bathrooms or kitchens or doing smaller projects. And I really, until I see otherwise in our data and in the, the market data that I'm seeing, I really am encouraging general contractors to hold steady because you can so 
quickly be upside down if you are not managing your time, your profits, your projects well, and stacking up a bunch of $15,000 bathrooms. If that's not the business model, that's not the core competency of your business, you're going to be in trouble. Absolutely. I, I think what you say no to is as important, maybe more important than what you say yes to. Definitely. So let's talk about feedback. You have the unique position to see lots of feedback for contractors from lots of different homeowners, lots of different geographies. And I'm curious, what are some trends? Or if you did an 80-20 analysis of the feedback that you receive during the pre-construction phase, what are the 20% of issues that 80% of the the negative feedback is coming from. In other words, if somebody said, hey, what should I fix in my sales process based on the feedback you're getting, what would you advise people to work on? So one of the things that we see and in, in, um, COVID has certainly brought this to the forefront for people because we can't be traveling around so much. We really encourage general contractors and homeowners to do a call before they do a site visit. I think that that initial phone call is really critical to establish whether or not you want to move forward with the project. It's a low investment of time for both of you, for both the homeowner and general contractor. And I see a lot, I see a lot of, of firms, this was pre-COVID, you know, really just like pushing to get to that site visit, the physical site visit. And that is a huge investment of time and energy and, and miles. And when you could maybe have a 20 minute phone call and again, one set expectations with a very low risk and two, make sure that it's even a project that you want to move forward with. So the feedback and the reason why I bring that up, the feedback that I get from homeowners, well, he came to the job site, he walked around, he or she, um, and I never, I, they, they hear back, but it, they hear back that they're not going to be estimating the project. That's a super frustrating experience for everybody. Yeah. Don't waste my time. Come to my house. If the answer is going to be no. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, I think the other um, piece of feedback that we see, so because of the way that our platform works, you know, as opposed to, you know, either other lead gen sites or other advertising or marketing stuff that people do, you know, we're tracking the performance of our general contractors profiles. We know exactly right? So that swipe left, swipe right. We know all the people that swiped left on you. <laughs> we know the people who swipe right. We know the projects like, okay, this type of project, you get furthest along, you get to site visit, you get to estimate, you get to awarded project. We can tell for each of our general contractors where in the funnel their, their business is breaking down. So it's not... Um, if we really try to customize all of our feedback, so the 80-20 rule, well, yes, there are some things that stand out for everyone. It really is uh, every general contractor gets an account manager and they have quarterly business reviews with um, their account manager where they really look at their you know, sales process to understand like, is it your profile? Do you need better pictures? Do you need more reviews? What's going on in your site visits? Here's the feedback we got on your site's visits. Here's the feedback like we're getting on your estimates. Here's your pricing compared to your competitors. Like, let's talk about why, why you're not getting as many projects as you would like, or why you're not growing your business to the next tier. What is your number one tip that you, that your team gives out when it comes to improving the sales process? Number one tip in improving the sales process. As I said, we just implemented what we're calling the virtual site visit. That is currently our number one tip to do virtual site visits. We, we believe in them so much that we actually built um, the ability to do video conferencing right into our platform. You know, obviously it was motivated a lot by COVID, but it's something that we have been encouraging our general contractors, encouraging our homeowners to do for years because that, 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 that phone call before the physical site visit is, is so critical. So I don't know, that's the only thing that's popping into my mind right now. That and like, don't take photos with your thumbs in them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that initial phone call. What are, what's one question that every contractor should ask during an initial phone call with a homeowner? What their timeline is. So we ask what their timeline is, but we ask in a very broad sense. So, you know, one to three months, one month, 30 days. 
I think getting really clear on expectations around time price. Price is another thing as you like evolve the scope and understand what the scope is. But so often homeowners, you know, they will tell us, well, we want to start in 30 days. And we ask them, do you have possession? Are you, do you own the home? Like, can you, but at least in New York City and Chicago and to some degree um, at, at uh, LA, this is true. There's permitting process. There is so many things in between them and starting construction that I think really understanding what timelines are in detail, like what the homeowner's expectation are on timeline. Yeah, got it. So let's talk about the post-award phase. What are some of the, the trends in feedback that you hear from homeowners about issues with um, once construction starts or once the, the contract has been signed? This one is easy. <laughs> this one is easy because it really, so we track every project to completion. And that means that we see the milestones, the payments, the, the communication on the vast majority of our projects. And the reason why projects come in need post award support, so they need an account manager or someone on my team to actively jump back into the project um, and communicate with both the homeowner and general contractor, is to reestablish productive communication. Projects, at least all of our projects, because we have screened for technical, because we, we know that these are licensed general contractors, because we know that they're the best. It's never, it's never, oh, something was built wrong or someone, I mean, maybe there is an occasionally some of that, but it is communication, expectations, and the breakdown of it every time, every time, every time. And that's why we have the partnership agreement. That's why we ask people to set clear expectations around communication. That's why, like, it's over-communicate. If, if any, every and all general contractor hearing this, <laughs> please over communicate with your clients, set clear expectations around those communications. Even when you think like, why would they want to know that? Like, and I'm, we're, I'm not trying to burden you with more work because I know how challenging the role is. Set a clear communication strategy and plan and then just follow it. And, and know that if you don't send one email, if you say you're going to send a weekly email and you don't send one email that one week, it feels like, I mean, you know, if you're in like a romantic relationship, like imagine they didn't like talk to you for a week. <laughs> Just be like, what's going on? What are they doing? Yeah. What I found there's, there's two things I, I learned after managing projects that my job wasn't to actually build stuff. My job was to be an information broker and my job was to get the right information to the right people at the right time, at the right level of detail. And if I did that, things went pretty smoothly. If I, I love that. If, if I didn't, then I would get these angry phone calls from the people who didn't get what they wanted. The other thing I found out is when you don't get information to people in a vacuum of information, they will come up with these very creative narratives in their head. And they're never good. They they're always, never good. They're never good. And, and you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, really. Like people, we have had, again, as I said, you know, we offer this mostly for homeowners, but it really has become something that general contractors rely on more because once a homeowner has started building a narrative about your firm, it is hard to turn that around. The, the narrative that they start creating, the reasons why they think that you, because the media, the media has given them all the fuel that they need. They just can plug your firm into some other nightmare story that they've heard from their friend, from HGTV, from wherever. And it's the, a lot of times, not all the time, our general contractors, we have not been perfect, but boy, when we have realized that we have made a bad match, when we see that the general contractor is not going to be able to finish the project, we will do everything in our power to get the right general contractor onto that project. We get general contractors to even complete other general contractors work, which you know is impossible, <laughs> just to make sure, because, you know, our GCs really understand that, you know, the lifting tide of Sweden does raise all boats. And so that homeowner having a great experience with Sweden overall helps all of us. But yeah, communication, communication, communication. 
post-award, during construction, pre-construction, the feedback that I will just give you is a clear sense of condition. information broker, as you said, the right level of detail, the right timing, the people who need to know on an assistant basis, and you'll yeah. be good. Whatever you're willing to do, tell them that, tell them what you're going to do, do it, tell them what you did, but uh, don't try to change the rules of the game midway through. Great, great advice. Um, so let's talk about how does... How does Sweeten make money? People might be thinking, well, this sounds great. You guys will bring leads to us. How, this is a business enterprise. So how yeah. does Sweeten? Yeah, we get a small commission. It's a sliding scale on projects that are awarded. On our- so as I said, most of our projects are around $100,000. So it's 6% for the first 100,000 and 2.5% each additional dollar. Usually, you know, for, for the general contractors in our firm, and again, it, it varies by project and by relationship to some degree, um, but for the general contractors in our firm, you know, to beat our firm, it's funny. I have not called our firm, our firm. <laughs> the general, con- the firms in ge- the general, the firms in the Sweeten network, woo, I'll make it happen. Um, really see that as some of the best marketing, advertising, sales, support money that they spend, right? Because we really, we really are in it with our team. And it sounds like it's an as needed source. If the opportunity's right, it's not something, if, if their backlog is full or if they decide to scale back, then they just swipe the other direction. Yeah, you just say no. Yeah. <laughs> you just say no. I mean, I will, I'll tell you that for our top guys, we are more than 50% their book of business per year. Hmm. So mostly people are swiping right and real. Yeah, I think once you understand how the Sweden works and you really are willing to be a real partner with us, right? To take feedback from your account manager, to really work with us, to take feedback from homeowners, the platform, to grow with us. It really is transformational to people. This is, and and they do it. You know, they'll come to us when they're booking. You know, three hundred thousand dollars a year. A couple of years later, they're doing five million dollars a year. And the only thing they've done is join the Sweeten platform, right? The Greek guy Nick. That was his story that I'm telling you. He won contractor of the year last year because of it um, it, at the Sweetie. So that I mentioned to you before, you know, if you work with us, like our only goal is to make you successful because that's how we're successful. Like if you can understand, like, you, you know, everything that we're saying today is not rocket science. You just need to do it and do it consistently and you can grow your business tremendously. So let's talk about business growth for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to land this thing. What um, you've obviously been involved with, watched and helped construction businesses grow. What, what are the challenges that they face like from an infrastructure standpoint? What, what's the, what are the top one or two challenges that if you're speaking to somebody who wants to scale up their business, what, what may they not be aware of? What might surprise them as they try to scale that business up? The importance of hiring, right? So it's one thing, you know, we typically have two tiers of general contractors that start with us. So, you know, folks who are a sole proprietor, they still are in the field. They don't have other project managers. They are both selling the jobs and running the job. Then we have folks who maybe have one or two project managers. As their business starts to grow, they're going to need to hire full-time project managers or people to be able to run multiple jobs for them. They just can't be everywhere. And those roles are so critical. And we've seen folks get them wrong as they've started to scale their business to the point where we start getting feedback about projects. And we, you know, because we know who the PM is on the project, we can then go back and we had this scenario happen. In fact, someone was doing really well on our platform, scaling quickly, like doing a great job and only had projects with problems with this one PM. And so we had to go back and say like, like you have a problem. And I just, I think that it's really, I think especially in the role of general contractor where you're used to hiring subs, you have a very different relationship to somebody who is actually representing you. They're a surrogate of you. They're a project manager. They're a full-time employee of your firm. That is where I think, and anybody who's in business knows this, I think hiring is like your number one, two, and three job as far as I'm concerned. It's so hard. It's so hard 
it's so hard to get right and so easy to get wrong. So as people think about scaling, I think they only think about signing more contracts and they've got to think about like, where am I going to source a new project manager? How am I going to interview them? What are the types of questions I'm going to ask? How am I going to test them? Where, like, <laughs> and you just can't like post on Craigslist and just find somebody. Yeah. And I, the common mistake that I see people making, and actually this comes from a study of uh, that the FMI Corp did several years ago. Of why do self, why do successful contractors fail? Big successful contractors fail. And one of the mindsets was, just book the work, we'll find the people to do it. And that is a, that's a trend. Somebody studied hundreds of businesses that went into bankruptcy and that's a trend. And a lot of people have the approach, well, um, I, I'm not going to hire somebody before I get the work. And I, so I'd rather just sell the work and then we'll figure it out. And when we have the need, that's when we'll go look for the resource. My advice is take the same approach that Asbury University used with my son, who's a basketball player. He just moved into college a couple of days ago. They started recruiting him two years ago. Before he was a junior in high school, they started building relationships. They're casting a wide net and they're recruiting. They're looking for people, recruiting 300% of what they might need, knowing that some are going to fall off, some won't be right. But they don't, they don't wait until August of this year to go look for players for this fall. That's right. And if college teams work like that, then construction businesses would be smart to do the same thing. So, yeah, yeah that's- We also have we also have the reverse happen a lot at Sweeten where, and which I think is, is possibly something, you know, as you think about your analogy of the recruiting, you know, if, if um, the person, the PM that you're thinking about recruiting, if they have ambitions to be their own general contractor at some point, you can also just sign them and say like, listen, I will work for me for three to five years. I'll teach you everything I know. And then you'll be ready to go and do your own thing. We have a number of firms. We have like a whole category of firms that we just call um, propagated, <laughs> meaning it was a PM that we know that left another firm to start their own business. Hmm. And so I think that, you know, cast a wide net and understand that, you know, these people might not be with you for life, but you have something that could be really valuable to them, which is you're currently running a successful general contracting business and they might have ambition to have their own one day. So just like lean into that. It's great advice. Great advice. Well, I want to be a good steward of your time. I'm sure we could talk about contractor red flags and customer red flags and that sort of stuff for hours. There's no shortage there. But um, if people want to find out more about Sweeten, um, where should they go specifically? So you know, any general contractor listening to your program is definitely the kind of ambitious, proactive firm that we want to be talking to and hopefully onboarding and, and helping them to grow their business. They can go to sweeten.com forward slash expert, E-X-P-E-R-T, expert. Great stuff. So one last question. You have an audience of a few thousand proactive, intelligent, intelligent, attractive, all sorts of Positive, <laughs> ambitious, yeah, yeah, life changing, motivated, etc. Construction business owners and leaders. Um, what is what's one thing you'd like to say to them? You're doing a great job. It's a hard job. You're doing a great job. Come work with us. Come partner with Sweeten. Let's keep growing your business. Good stuff, Gene. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to be on here. Thanks so much for what you're doing. Thank you so much, Deb, for having me. Are you preparing to purchase materials? Why would you settle for 30-day terms or worse, no terms at all, when you can have 120-day terms with any of your suppliers? Finally, a finance partner built for contractors. Learn more at build.com forward slash C-L-E. That's B-I-L-L-D dot com slash C-L-E. There you go. Hope you got something out of that. Hope you got some good information. But most importantly, I hope you took something away that you can implement whatever that is. Take one thing that you learned, write it down, implement it, make it a habit, put a system, put a process in place. That's really the only way you're going to get any value out of this podcast. And frankly, that's the only way you're going to get value out of any information that you take in. So be sure to head over to sweeten.com slash expert, see what other general contractors are saying about Jean and her team's platform, what they've built over at sweeten.com. 
I think it's a great thing. I hear a lot of people who are frustrated with their lead sources. They're tired of buying leads from services that automatically put them in a bidding war with other people. And this matchmaking service is uh, it's pretty cool. So I highly recommend you check it out. As always, I appreciate the ratings and the reviews. If you could take a moment and open up the podcast player that you're listening to this on, leave a rating, leave a review. That means a lot to me and also helps get the word out there to other folks. If you're looking for some resources to boost profits, eliminate chaos, be sure to head over to Builder Masterclass. Com. You'll be able to download some productivity hacks, a guide to optimize your overhead. There's one thing in that guide that everybody needs to do, and it involves fraud. Okay, so check that out. You could be at risk of a nightmare situation with regard to fraud. So go to buildermasterclass.com. Look for those resources. There are videos there. You can find out about masterclasses that are available but all those resources are available over at buildermasterclass.com. And if you're a construction business owner and you want to talk to me about working together in one of my coaching programs, then the first step is go to constructionleadingedge.com. Click on the red button that says schedule a call. If you're a business owner, this is for construction business owners exclusively. You can schedule a call with me. And we'll jump on a free call, talk through some of your biggest roadblocks, get you headed in the right direction, and then talk about what working together on a one-on-one basis could look like for you. As always, I really appreciate the feedback, the ratings, the reviews, the the comments. Let's connect on LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever it's at. I appreciate all the feedback. Thanks you so much for listening. My name is Todd DeWalt, and I will see you next time.